Parliamentary colleagues, if any are here from either house, welcome to Speaker's House. But in particular, I want very warmly to welcome the Ambassador. I want to welcome Ronald Lauder as President of the World Jewish Congress, a man who I hope rejoices in the celebrity and significance of the important office that he holds on behalf of you all. Come on, my friends. In the spirit of the occasion, put your hands together for Ronald. I want you also enthusiastically, you've got to get into the spirit of the thing, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome Jonathan Arkrush, whom I feel I've come to know well over the years, who is, I think, now two-thirds of the way through his first, but possibly not his only term, as president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And notwithstanding the burdensome character of his responsibilities, he still has a fairly full head of hair and a warm, almost beatific smile on his face. In support of Jonathan, let's hear it! Thank you. But I must admit, and this is bias and partisanship on my part, though within, I hope, acceptable limits. Oh, and it's good to see some parliamentary colleagues here present, namely Wes Streeting and Stephen Doughty. I hope you will understand if I extend an especially effusive welcome to someone I came to regard as a friend in Parliament, and for the loss of whom from Parliament we are the poorer, and that is Gillian Merrin, who does a magnificent job <laughs> as Chief Executive of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And as I look around the room, I see other people, Jerry, whom I know very well. I see Julia Neuberger. A few moments ago, I saw, I was going to say Stuart Polak. I will probably more properly and deferentially refer to him as the noble Lord, the Lord Polak. And there are lots of other people here, too, some of whom will be visiting Speaker's House for the first time, others of whom will perhaps have been regular visitors over the years. But you could not be more welcome here. Perhaps I can start with a truth and a falsehood. The truth is that I am the first Jewish Speaker of the House of Commons, and I think I'm also right in saying that I'm the first Speaker of the House of Commons to pay an official visit to Israel, which it was my great privilege to do earlier this year as the guest of Speaker Edelstein, and we broke bread together. We had really useful and productive, convivial discussions. I met a great many parliamentarians in the process, and I like to think that in a modest way, but not too modest, the visit underscored and reinforced the importance of the continuing good relationship that subsists between the United Kingdom and Israel, a relationship which continues to subsist and must continue to subsist, irrespective of which government happens to be in power at the time, either in Britain or in Israel. And in a very real sense, irrespective of the particular policies that either of those incumbent governments might be pursuing. There is room for a degree of eclecticism in these matters. There are lots of people of the Jewish faith or supportive of the Jewish community who have different views about the future direction of the Jewish state. But upon one point, they are all rightly unanimous. The Jewish state is here to stay, and rightly so. What, at the risk of modest self-indulgence, is the falsehood? The falsehood, my friends, is the pervasive myth that I am, in fact, the shortest man <laughs> ever to be speaker. Now, look, I'm not embarrassed about being short, ladies and gentlemen, my friends. I have always been short. I'm 54 years old and I remain short. And given the known impact of the aging process on physiognomy, the great likelihood is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. And about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, I'm as intensely relaxed as the noble Lord Lord Mandelson once famously said that new labor was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. But I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy. You would expect 
the speaker, forsooth, to have done his research. And if in no other respect, at least in that respect, I hope not to disappoint you, I have done. And simply as a matter of historical fact, it's quite wrong when some of these more down-market, low-music hall scribblers say, oh, well, Burko's the shortest man ever to be speaker. Sir John Bussey, Speaker of the House of Commons in the United Kingdom, from 1394 <laughs> to 1398, Sir John Wenlock, Speaker from 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, Speaker of the House in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am, <laughs> although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. No fewer than seven of my predecessors met their death on the executioner's block. One was killed in battle, and a further poor unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. So you will understand that this enables me to view the woes and challenges which afflict and confront the House of Commons, and which I admit periodically afflict and confront me with a degree of historical perspective. That is to say, whatever else happens to me, I'm not likely to lose my head. Now, I, at least I hope not, absolutely, there's a rather unhelpful interjection from a representative of Ilford there, which offers me no complete surety on my continued survival. I don't wish to discombobulate you. You're very welcome here, and it's absolutely right that an organisation that works in almost 100 countries, and is now 81 years into its existence, and magnificently led by Ronald should be here, but there's also a sense in which you follow the very good example of my good and dear friend, I must tell you, Moshi Kanter, great friend of the Jewish community, great business person, great philanthropist. The European Jewish Congress came here on the 24th of November 2015 at Moshi's request, and Moshi's been a visitor here more than once, not least when Speaker Edelstein came. And I don't mind telling you that amongst many friends within the British Jewish community, I regard Michael Levy as a dear friend. And I have to say, he doesn't fundraise from here because we don't have fundraising in Speaker's house. But he is quite the most spectacular fundraiser and networker that I have ever met. And the great thing about Michael, which is so true of so many people in the Jewish community, is that he spends a wholly disproportionate amount of his time, as I think does Moshi, thinking about and trying to provide for people less fortunate than he is. A very typical representation of the Jewish community, not just in this country, but around the world. I had my bar mitzvah on Valentine's Day 1976 at Finchley Reform synagogue. I'm not going to seek to hoodwink or beguile you by pretending that I'm a particularly assiduous Jew. I'm not a religious person. I just feel a great identification with my Jewish heritage. And the great thing about the World Jewish Congress and indeed its European counterpart is that it has for decades been committed to fighting for the rights of Jews and Jewish communities right across the world. The importance of Jewish history, of Jewish culture, of Jewish identity, and indeed, sir, if I may say so, of Jewish security, both physical and political, can scarcely be overstated. Now, we all know that there are elements of Islamic fundamentalism who have long harbored the deepest and most irrational hostility to the Jewish communities and to individual Jews. You know, my friends, there was a time when I thought that the threat from the extreme right, as in neo-Nazism, was a thing of the past. But I first became all too uncomfortably and painfully conscious that twas not so when that historic court case took place in our country, all relating, you will recall, to that 
wonderful truth-telling book by the American academic Deborah Lipstadt, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. And you will no doubt recall, I'm sure Julia Neuberger remembers it very well, in fact she can probably reproduce the contents of the book backwards in Sanskrit in her sleep if so moved. <laughs> Deborah Lipstadt contended that David Irving, in the most dishonest and unacademic way, had polluted and distorted his evidence, not least by fiendishly dishonest translation from the original German, to misrepresent the truth about Hitler and the Nazis. And you will recall that David Irving sued her and doubtless her publishers. And he was deservedly trounced. But although he was trounced and humiliated and his reputation trashed, it just reminded me that there are still sinister and evil people out there peddling this filth. And it finds its physically violent expression in the English Defence League and indeed, I may say, of course, in the now diminished but still existent British National Party, and more particularly in probably the most sinister new emerging organization on the extreme right in this country, namely the neo-Nazi group, the prescribed group, National Action. There are still people denying the Holocaust or alternatively glorying in it and holding up Adolf Hitler as being a great figure in our history. So there is a threat and there is the subtle but insidious anti-Semitism of a more inverted commas polite but equally pernicious kind reflected in the writings and the private thoughts of people at all levels of the establishment and in the professions, in parts of the media, in parts of public life. So we should not be paranoid, but equally we should not be complacent. There is a threat to Jewish people and to Jewish security. Jewish people and Jewish security in this country and indeed across Europe and around the world. So the work that you do is of an importance that cannot possibly be exaggerated. And I want you to know that you have friends here in the British Parliament, a number of whom are here today, not merely from within the Jewish community, but from well beyond the Jewish community. And you certainly have a friend in this speaker. So thank you for coming. I think you're going to hear either from Jonathan or from Ronald ere long. I'm going to toddle off shortly to the chamber to chair the European Union withdrawal bill, but I just want to say a warm welcome to you, and I hope you will feel inclined to come again. Thank you very much. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to stand here. I want you to be taller than me. <laughs> this is the only way I will be. My mother taught me never speak after a rabbi or a politician. And she was right, but thank you for what you say. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sticking up for the Jewish people the way you do, because we need all the friends, and you have been a particular friend. And um, now we know you have menorah, so we saved some money. And um, <laughs> giving you this honey pot for a sweet new year. Senator, it's really nice. <laughs> Bless you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. I shall treasure it.